Hello and welcome to The Last Standy, a board game podcast coming to you from three very exciting countries all across Europe. I'm joined here today by Alessio. Uh, hello. Uh, uh, did you miss that? Yes, we did. <laughs> there was a long silence and then Alessio, obviously you're down the far end of a tunnel or something. Uh, and Audrey. <laughs> hello, hello, I'm here, I'm here. How are you? A lot shorter tunnel there. <laughs> Uh, I'm your host, Fen, and today we're going to be talking about Black Sonata, Patchwork and Era Medieval Age. But first we'll start with a little bit of news and then the catch-up. So, first of all, uh, Holy Grail Games has announced they're shutting down, they're filing bankruptcy. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's a bit sad. Uh, in particular, for me, I've been eyeing up a few of their games for a while, and the moment they announced this, they all went out of stock in my local game store. Oh, no. There's people flooded in to buy them so yeah uh museum and uh encyclopedia i was for, and rally man those are three i was interested in but uh i have to pass on that um they put a statement on their website uh holy grail dot games and you can read it there uh they've had some serious problems um I think part of it is a lesson to learn in why you shouldn't be launching a Kickstarter before your previous Kickstarter is in shipping and fulfillment. But also, um, they've had some big issues with their logistics. Like the company meant to be shipping things out was shipped games to people who didn't even back um, and similar. In fact, I know somebody who has received a copy of Encyclopedia and it's like, I didn't back this. So if there's anyone around who's a backer, uh, they they will I'll send it on to them. Um, yeah, so that's a, a real shame. Personally, I think it might be like I think we might see more things like this going ahead. Um, I, I I just can't see Kickstarter carrying on to work the way it is, but uh, we'll see. Uh, the other one is that well, two is that El Grande's getting a reprint. Which is super exciting. Yeah, that's yay. <laughs> yep, very exciting that. And uh, for some reason, um, Restoration Games have announced that they're retiring Cobble and Fog and Robin Hood versus Bigfoot. Um, they said they're calling them In the Vault from their Unmatched series. I would say if you've been at all interested in Unmatched and you haven't pulled the trigger, you should. And you should pull the trigger on getting these if you can because Cobble and Fog and Robin Hood versus Bigfoot are really good sets they have fantastic characters and a bunch of things i find it unusual that they've chosen to retire ones with characters who are um in the public domain uh, i guess maybe they have contracts on the others is all i can yeah, think of they they announced that uh, this was to make space to make room for the upcoming releases i think they uh, this is a figure from uh, actual people uh, thinking over this but but they are about to release uh, five or six big boxes and uh, because of that uh, they are making space with the stuff which was still in the spotlight earlier this is still baffling as a decision but that's wh how they motivated it yeah they must have some kind of um figures at the back to justify why they've picked these uh, we can only really speculate I do own those. Uh, Robin Hood is really good. Bigfoot's immense fun. And Sherlock Holmes is fantastic. Um, the others are The Invisible Man and um, Count Dracula. And I think Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Um, they're all classics. Yeah, that's Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, mm. sure. And The Invisible Man, for sure. I don't know about the... Uh, Sherlock Holmes. It's yes. definitely Sherlock Holmes. And I do believe yeah. it is. I uh, don't know about Dracula. I, yeah. I'm pretty sure it's Dracula. Um but I won't look it up now. Anyway, uh, with all of that to one side, uh, how have things been for you, Audrey? Uh, hectic at work, uh, which is a big thing. Um, took me lots of time. Um, I've been doing a little bit of painting. Um, not really a lot, but I'm trying in 2023 to, how to say that, clear my painting depths, like stuff I promised to friends I would paint for them um, many years ago. And which I'm finally working on, so that will be um, a great thing to put behind me. 
um, as far as games go, yeah, I'm doing a few um, evenings at uh, the local uh, board game cafe, which I already talked about in a previous episode for another uh, evening. And the last one, uh, we played. Um, uh, what was the first game? I don't remember the first game that we play, and the second one is Galera Bagos. Not sure that's the English title as well. Uh, where you are survivors on a lost island, and you have different actions to pick food, water, wood, uh, and you will see how big of a raft you have to escape, uh, and who you can <laughs> put on the, the raft. I'm not sure Galera Pagos is the English uh, title. Uh, oh, th th there was a, co uh, a game called Galera Pagos, but I, I don't think it was building a raft. Yeah, I've not heard of this game before. Um, when you start, first started describing, I was like, well, that sounds like Robinson Crusoe, but obviously it's not Robinson Crusoe, because... We'd call it Robinson Crusoe. So, yeah, I've not heard of it. Uh, Helapagos. Ah. Yeah, in, in English, that's Helapagos. Uh, so, yeah, we played this one, and uh, I ended up not uh, setting up the game properly, so it ended up a bit earlier than it should have been. Um, and so that was a bit uh, annoying because we were a bit short on time and it ended up being a bit messy but I mean when you have kind of semi cop games it is likely to get messy to be honest um, yeah and yeah when possible we will probably keep on playing Aeon Trespass Odyssey we made it past the first uh, what's the name uh, acclimatization I think when you replace some of the exploration cards Acclimation, uh, yeah. yeah. Acclimation. Uh, and, 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 yeah, for me, that's, that's, that's it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and you, Alessio, what's new? <laughs> well, thanks for asking. Well, uh, people listening couldn't know, but uh, we are recording a lot these days. So not a lot since uh, last time I was asked, but uh, I have to say I have at least one piece of news. I was uh, not there for the other recording, so yeah. I don't know. <laughs> you can listen with other people. Yeah. That's no problem. <laughs> So, uh, basically, I have one item of news, which is I was gifted for my birthday, which is a delayed gift because my birthday is in January, but uh, uh, I was gifted for my birthday um, a game book, like a puzzle game book, like the ones for the exit the books series, but it was Cypher Files, which is actually a very popular book for... Uh, uh, I'm not using this term derogatorily, but for casuals. And uh, it's a kind of fun uh, puzzle book in which you have to crack a case uh, by going through following chapters and the solution for the earlier chapters helps you with the uh, following ones. It was kind of fun. It was a bit leaning on the easy side. I have to say I I completed the entire book in four days. Uh, I think a couple of hours a day. So it's uh, not a lot of time, but uh, in the end it was pretty fun. So it, it's fun for entry level, okay? <laughs> Something being fun, I would say, is generally what matters most. <laughs> yeah, fun, fun is okay, fun is okay. Uh, it's a bit weird because you have to enter keywords on a website to go on and the th that was mostly cool because there are easter eggs and stuff and hidden uh, things to discover but the it was a bit uh, terrible in the in, uh, it was a bit picky with the input you gave it so if you added this one space because you were copying and pasting or stuff like that uh, you got a wrong solution and that was uh, that, that that helped padding the time actually so <laughs> i remember which game we played first last time at the board game cafe and it's a special case for me it Special yeah, case. It, okay. it was, it, it, yeah, it was Splendor Marvel, and uh, I have to say, I hated Splendor the first time I played it, I didn't understand the point of it, and now I don't like it either, I understand slightly the point, and I can look at Marvel Crackers on the card. Yeah, I have to say, I don't, I am not a fan of Splendor either, 
I like Splendor Dur, but that's, <laughs> yes, <laughs> you got a point. <laughs> so uh, that's basically all about me. What about you, Fen? All quiet on the Western Front. It's the rainy season here on the island, so not doing much really, apart from um, organising, uh, painting and playing some board games and watching the dog go, can I go outside? And you open up the door and she looks at it and then looks at you and then goes, it's raining out here. Why did you let it rain? Sort it out. I'm going to go and sit. So that's pretty much it. The quiet, it's a quiet period right now. Cool. Yeah. Um, right. Well, uh, in which case, it's time to grab your yellow notepads and your finest quill pen as we take to the streets of Shakespeare's London in Black Sonata. So this is originally a print and play game. Um, it is a solo game, plays about 30 minutes. It's by John Keane and printed by Sideroom Games, who do a lot of very good games, solo games, and I'm going to recommend a few at the end of this. But Black Sonata is one I've wanted for a fair while. Um, because, and not so much a theming, um, I don't much care for Shakespeare's plays. They tend to not really interest me at all. Um, but uh, I love the concept of a solo hidden movement deduction game because it's really hard to pull that off without an app. Um, and I quite like not having to worry about an app, you know. So I'm not going to go into huge details about the mechanics of Black Sonata because a lot of it, it's hard to describe. But visually, it's very clear because you have to mana mechanically manipulate a bunch of things. But here is the base concept. Um, there is a there's a very old mystery about uh, well, Shakespeare wrote a bunch of sonnets, um, and they speak to a fair youth and a dark lady. And there was a lot of like there still is a lot of debate as to who these sonnets were written for, who they reference, and. There's a bunch of, of women who've been connected with Shakespeare and there's speculation that one of those is this dark lady in his sonnets. So Black Sonata has you uh, as, I guess, uh, it's Elizabethan era, isn't it? Elizabethan um, paparazzi? Or just some kind of generic creep? Because you're chasing around London after this mysterious woman trying to figure out who she is. Uh, heck, who knows? Maybe you're a time traveller who's gone back in time to try and solve this once and for all. Who knows? Uh, the conceit of the whole game is the black lady, dark lady, will wander around um, a small board that represents London. This is like a very old London. London's very small at this time compared to how it is now. Uh, and the board has a bunch of spaces. It's a node-based movement thing and they have symbols on them. The symbols will indicate what locations the dark lady is potentially at. At the start of the game, you take a deck of dark lady characters. There's, uh, is it six suits? Yes, six suits, two in each suit. You shuffle them up, you put one underneath the board or next to the board. That is who the dark lady actually is. And then you put one of the others underneath all the location uh, site cards. Uh, and the rest you put underneath a Dark Lady Clues deck. And what you're trying to do is encounter the Dark Lady in locations on the map enough times to gather clues. By, you take these little clue cards out of the clue deck one at a time. And they'll give you information. I'll talk about that a little bit later. And then you'll hopefully be able to, at the end of the game, make a deduction as to what three qualities um, this, this woman has. And... That will allow you to reveal her identity. Start of the game, you will pick. You take this deck of, uh, like, this is a path deck. It's the route that she's taking through. And it's got a bunch of letters at the top and bottom. And you'll pick one position of the letters. Say, like, top left corner, you might pick that. It's the easiest. And you'll organise the entire deck into alphabetical order. And then flip it over and cut it a few times. You mustn't change the order. Um, you know, you can't, you know, you need to keep it in the same order, um, but you can cut it any number of times so that the lady's starting position is randomised. And while you're doing this, you really don't want to be looking at the deck at all. You're kind of doing it without peeking. And then you'll put a 
clock card on the back with um, giving you a number of times you can go through the deck. So it represents like the very bottom of the deck and the number of times you go. The lower the number, the less time you have to solve the mystery. Um, I jumped in and started playing on a two. Uh, so I only had two passes to get through the deck. Uh, it gives you a bit of sliding difficulty. So you can give yourself more time if you're struggling to make deductions. You can give yourself less time or you can pick harder routes. On your turn, you will uh, do one of several different things. You can choose to move to another location. You can choose to search the location you're at if you believe the Dark Lady is at that location. Um, you can use a Fog Action card if you've drawn that. A little bit on that later. Or you can pass and do nothing. So essentially, you're looking to travel around the board on one of your goals and collect all of the sight cards because you need those to be able to confront the dark lady if she is at a given location the second thing you'll be doing then is after you've done your turn is you will put the top card of the deck to the bottom of it and you need to like hold this in your hand and slide it down so you only expose the next card and it will show a symbol that indicates that's the type of location she's at so you know she's moved say from a house to uh, a tree like a park, nature area outside of London. So then you can maybe narrow down where she was, where she's gone to. And you're trying to get to where she's going next so you can be there when she arrives and you can have a, a creepy little peek at her and learn something about her. At, you could, after you've done, when you do that, you have to take the given card, the slight card, and you will slide it underneath. Um, sorry, you'll take the clue card and slide, clue card, path card path card and slide it under the sight card and there's a little hole punched in it and if you've got it right the dark woman silhouette will appear through a keyhole uh, then you get to take a clue if you and then once you've done that the path card is removed from the game and you'll be putting a fog card there's a fog card that's put in it instead the order is slightly different to the way i described it i realized the slight describe it slightly out of order um i would really recommend if you're interested, you also watch a YouTube video of someone playing this so you can see how they manipulate the deck and how they slide it all round. Um, but uh, it's it's very neat. It's very well done. It does require you to be very cognizant that you, you shouldn't spoil yourself and you need to do these actions in a certain way. The other way you can try it out is as a TTS simulator, tabletop simulator, TTS simulator, the S is for simulator, a tabletop simulator version with an automated script that runs it all and it will not spoil things for you. I gave it a go to see if it was any good. It's fantastic. It's a great implementation of the game. So you've gained a clue um, and what you do is you take it and you'll flip the card over and it shows three symbols and a historically accurate uh, woman from the time. And on the right hand side, it tells you how many of these symbols this particular woman has in common with the card of the suit that you've removed from the game. So as an example, if you have a rose uh, as your dark lady and you draw Anne Hathaway, um, it, she has a chain which represents a link to Shakespeare, a rattle which means she's had children, and um, a musical note which has something to do with music that I've forgotten off the top of my head. But anyway, those are these three symbols. And on her card on the right-hand side, it says if she uh, that she has zero or two of these traits in common with the Dark Lady. So you're going to be working your way through and trying to deduce um, based on each clue you get. And it'll narrow down the pool of possibilities. So you might be looking at, okay, well, I know that she's got one in common with heart, chain, and um, ink, quill. Uh, and she has zero or two in common with chain, rattle and music and then you keep building on that until you narrow the deduction all the way down. Once you're confident you've worked out her three traits you need to get to a place where she is, find her one last time and then take that big step of flipping up the card, the dark lady cards, you confront her and see if you've matched the traits. That's it. That's the game. It plays in 30 minutes. Um, it is uh, quite a nice little production. You can print and play it. I believe all the files are still on Board Game Geek. Or yeah. you can buy a copy from uh, Side Room Games, which I did, um, because I think Side Room Games do really nice production. They have done. This is linen finish. This is um, very nice and clear. It's not fancy, 
but it has a good look to it and a period appropriate look. You get wooden tokens, deck boxes. Um, it's even got room to hold all the expansions, which I'll talk about in a moment. But first of all, Alessio, I know you've played this. So what are your thoughts? Well, uh, basically, you recap it. My overall thoughts is that the game is very elegant. Uh, it's uh, I have a lot of respect for in the movement games done well because uh, it's hard to make a in the movement game with less than three players and mind management is absolutely my best game for two players within the movement but Black Sonata uh, makes in the movement through deduction uh, an art it's incredible how simple the game is how how little components it requires to play i think it's 60 cards if i remember correctly something around that yeah yeah something like that um here and we are 13 poker sized cards 54 mini euro 11 with yeah, holes yeah yeah about 60 yeah. cards then yeah. and with so little cards uh, you can play a complete game which feels a lot fulfilling uh, the, the game uh, one thing that cannot be possibly conveyed is the is the rush you feel when you are closing in with uh, clues because uh, it sometimes it happens that you know who the dark lady is but you are too far and you have not enough time sometimes you have no clue and uh, you, you continue and you maybe try to do a reveal and you flip the cards but you spend time it's everything comes together it's beautiful i i like a lot this game and uh, uh, there was a time at the beginning of the covid pandemic when there were a lot of print and play games i think that uh, i got the chance to experience black sonata as print and play then i think the, the one with space cards i think nine space cards i think under falling sky is possibly the original version and maki and uh, they were all three beautiful games, all three recommended. Actually, we now talked about all, all three of them now, today. So uh, it was beautiful, and Black Sonata is absolutely a recommendation. If you cannot afford the... Uh, if you cannot uh, actually recover, because it's very affordable, uh, the, uh, the, the retail version, you should at least try the print and play, because it's beautiful and plays itself uh, very well. The only thing that you need to be wary is that actually the card should all have the same backs because that's important in this game. So <laughs> if you print and play, have some cover, some dark, uh, some darkened uh, sleeves or something like that. But that's it. Absolutely recommended. Yeah. So uh, just as a design viewpoint, if you're somebody who really likes um, card designs or game designs this is doing something that is incredibly impressive it's obviously involved yeah. a lot of spreadsheets and a lot of planning and a lot of testing um and it is an impressive one-man job so as i said you can play it on tabletop simulator if you want to see what it's like um but i really would recommend supporting and getting the cyber Room games edition it's not very expensive now i have one thing one warning with respect to this there's only two dark ladies in each suit and that does mean you can reach a point, if you play it extensively and too much, that you will just know who the Dark Lady is. You still need to grab the right stuff for the deductions, and but kind of maybe going through everything, the motions. It, it can lose a little bit of the excitement there. However, first of all, just don't overplay it. Like, do not obsessively play this. Um, I, I, was enjoy going it. To, I was going to ask about that, about replayability yeah. and... <laughs> Yes, so it's got very good replayability um, unless you go crazy and obsessively play it multiple times in a row. If you like play it like once a week, once a month or whatever, or when you go on holiday, you should forget enough and you can still have a good time. However, if that is a problem, you can get the Fair Youth expansion, which came out in 2020. Uh, it, it has a bunch of modular pieces you can add in, you can put them all in, or however you want to do it. Uh, the Fair Youth is an additional deduction task. That's the first module. You're looking to find the Fair Youth. Um, and the great thing is, if you're actually at, if you're like already at his location, uh, you get told a lie, so you have to deduce where he is to surprise him, or even for extra points, catch him with the Dark Lady together. Then there's the rendezvous challenge, which means you now also have to deduce where 
the rendezvous is, so that adds more to try and figure out. There's the rival poet who can either provide you with more clues when you, if you catch up with them, or it can interfere with your attempts to succeed. Um, there's waypoint and traces, which gives you some extra tools to track where the Dark Lady is uh, in within the stealth slash park deck. And the big one is the Darker Ladies, which swaps the clue cards in the base game and gives each Dark Lady a new set of characteristics and a slightly harder deduction challenge. And it's not particularly expensive as an expansion goes, but it will add on to the price. However, um, that you can get more longevity that way. I think it's a good expansion. Um, before I finish, uh, if those, if you're not sure about those, there are a few other like hard recommendations from Side Room Games. Marquee's already been mentioned. Elements of the Gods is a fantastic game that plays one player and can go up to five. Uh, there's Grove, a nine card solitaire game, which is a fantastic implementation. Again, it's impressive how much you're doing with such a small number of components. Um, and last, no, two years ago now, For Northwood came out, which is a solo trick taking game, and that's also absolutely fantastic. So there's a bunch of additional recommendations. Um, support side room games if you can, I think they do really good work. So, yeah, from a time of mistresses to a place of seamstresses, it's patchwork with Audrey. Yes, Patchwork. Yeah, uh, th this is a game uh, from Uwe Rosenberg. I hope I'm pronouncing it properly. Um, published by Look Good Games, and I bought it like a while ago. Uh, actually, I don't so long ago that I don't remember, but somehow in 2021, and I finally got a play of it with my husband maybe two two weeks ago or even last weekend. And I have to say it. I enjoyed it as a two-player game because yes, it is two-player games uh, exclusively. You can't play this one being three players or four or whichever number. Uh, and yeah, I think it's a very smart game for two players. So the idea is uh, in the vein of uh, Calico that we uh, spoke about already. There is the team which is being yeah seamstresses. Um, um, ah, I can't find the word, quilting and Kilt. yeah, quilting together and these kind of things. And each player is going to try to make a uh, quilt, a blanket, and uh, make it um, with points in the end, you have points. Uh, but in, um, in patchwork, the particularity is that the pieces of fabric that you will uh, sew together are polyominoes. So you get them from around the table. There is a they are arranged in a circle around the table, and um, you have a neutral marker. How is it? Is how how it is called, which will move around the um, uh, bits of polyominoes as you pick them, and this marker will tell you which uh, tiles are available. It's only the three tiles clockwise from it that are available from the players to pick from. And every time a player picks a tile, the marker comes at its position. So it will rotate around the markers of the tiles during the game and uh, it will basically condition the choices. And you can, as a player, depending on how, let's say, smart gamer you are, pick uh, a tile depending on which uh, tiles it will make available later. So there is a bit of thought to put into that. Then once you have picked your um, tile there are two things to keep in mind. There are two markers on each tile that will condition how you pick them. One of them is a cost in buttons. Button is the currency and the points in this game. You spend buttons to get uh, a tile and put it on your blanket. So you have a tile, a player tile, which is, I did not note how many squares, 10 by 10, 11 by 11, something like that. And so you grab your tile and you put it on your uh, player board. You have the button cost of each tile, which is written on it. It's a symbol of button with a number. And the other one is the time, because it takes time to sew pieces together, right? And depending on the complexity of the piece or the shape, generally, it takes more or less time. So this time is going to have an impact on a common board, which is going to be the round 
board. Uh, this is what counts you, how, many, how much time you have left to play, and also some special uh, actions. So when you have, for instance, uh, you pick a tile which, is, uh, which has a symbol of four times, so there is a hourglass and with a figure as well uh, near, near it, and you advance your marker on the round um, tile of the this amount. Now there is something very specific with the game which I think is very interesting is that the players don't play one after the other. It depends on the position of your own marker on the round uh, board. So the player which is behind in the, on this board will play. If, for instance, the player tile which makes them go ahead two in time and are still behind the other player which is first, they play again until they go in front of the other player. So it's very, I think it's something very interesting because the tiles that you will pick will have three things to consider. The first one being their shape to put them on your player board. The second one being the cost in button because if you don't have enough buttons, you can't afford them. And the last one uh, being uh, yeah, the, the time, which will condition the how many turns you can play basically in the game. And all of these, I think they combine very nicely. There is uh, one special thing on the round uh, board, which is that at some moments, after I maybe 10 uh, times or 15 times, you will go past a button symbol. At this moment, you score the number of buttons that you have on your um, blanket. Because some of the tiles, not everyone, as a symbol of buttons, or sometimes two, sometimes three. Uh, it's a various amount, and so at when you go uh, through the button symbol on the round track, you will score this amount of buttons that you can then spend to buy more tiles. So there is a kind of, uh, I will not call that an engine building because it's a bit uh, one dimensional, but there is a kind of resource building, a uh, resource engine, which I think is I think it's a very interesting layer on top of just, yeah, let's see how many turns we play and pick the, the tiles and put them on my uh, blankets and see how much I score. As well, at five times over the uh, turn marker, um, turn track, uh, there are some lever squares. And these lever squares are just one square for the blanket. They are the only way to have just one square to fill a hole in the blanket. So there can be very high competition when getting near this to, oh, I'm going to get uh, pieces of fabric that are slow to, 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 to sew, so I don't get ahead too fast and that I can play more and then so I can get more buttons on my blanket and when I go um, through the button symbol I get more buttons and then I will be the one to get uh, the level uh, square because I need a square to fill uh, some place. And, and yeah, I think, I think all of these combine in that you, you have a, a game that is much smarter than it looks, I think. Uh, because when you pick the box, you're like, oh, okay, I'm going to put polyaminos on, on, on the board, and not just that, uh, and, and I really like that. Um, we ended up playing one game, um, we did not, uh, none of us did fill the board or close to that, and we ended up with a perfect draw at minus two points each. Because every single uh, square which is empty at the end of the game is negative points. And yeah, we, we, we both had something like a fifth of our board, which was completely empty. Um, so uh, that was, that I, th I think that was, yeah, very funny. And I think that's a game where you definitely do get better as you play. Uh, the first game, yeah, you might be, oh, okay, I'm bad. And the second one, oh, I understand that these styles, this style look very interesting, but at the end it has some drawbacks uh, because it, costs lots of time and so I'm going to get ahead in the track and this is time that I can't recover because it's lost and yeah I think that there is much more uh, to look out deep and it's not a soft face game while you could think that <laughs> yeah yeah uh, I have the Halloween edition which I got because it's more readable and visually um, interesting so it has eyeballs instead of buttons. But, uh, 
Yeah, it has to be said, the game is phenomenally well balanced, very deep, very interesting, and yeah, like you say, it's it's can be very close between players. There's room for some skillful movements, but I do think um, a more experienced player isn't automatically going to dunk on their opponent, yeah. um, which can be important in a two-player game. You don't really want to sit down and play against somebody else and just be like, oh, well, I know all the optimal stuff, slap, 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 slap. Um, so... I I like this. Uh, I do genuinely put it on the list of Uwe Rosenberg games that I really enjoy. Um, and uh, I, I've i also played a few of the spin-offs. Um, there's Patchwork Doodle, which is a roll and write version. Um, it's not great, so probably just skip on that one. There's Patchwork Express, which inexplicably makes a simpler version of the original version by having a smaller area and less complex pieces. You can play it in about 10 minutes, so it's kind of, I think, the travel edition would be the way to think of it. And then the one which I'm super excited about, um, I only know about it in by name, um, it's called Stack and Stuff, and you basically pack a moving truck. Um, It's very apparently a more streamlined version of Patchwork, which is like mind-boggling that that exists but it's very cool you load up in the on an image of a truck and then you've got a little like road that you drive along to do your deliveries instead of um like uh, instead of you know a track you go around for patchwork it's a road uh it's it looks super cool i'm just waiting for it to become available because yeah that that satisfies me the idea of stacking boxes correctly <laughs> it's the same reason i like um i think it's called shelfies terrible name but a really fun like connect four um stacking game so yeah if if I, I, I if i remember correctly in that uh let's say region there was uh p- there were people looking to make a game which was going to be called kalax uh, about shelfing board games um <laughs> <laughs> yeah who doesn't like organizing yeah. stuff me because i don't have enough cupboards i still have about 40 games on the floor upstairs because I can't afford to buy the shelving to finish putting them up. I can't put together my painting studio upstairs either because of the, that lack. So I love organising them afterwards, but I do hate board games of a non-standard size. <laughs> yeah. Mm, yeah. I understand fully. How about you, Alessio? Have you played Patchwork? Oh, well, uh, I have to say that Patchwork is probably my favorite uh, Uwe Rosenberg game just by number of plays. Uh, it has to do a lot with the fact that uh, it's probably the, the, the oldest game uh, from Uwe Rosenberg on BGA because actually my two favorite games for from Uwe Rosenberg are A Feast for Odin and Patchwork. So that's it. Uh, I just have to, uh, since you basically already told everything i just have to say uh one thing i love about patchwork is the is the shenanigans you can put up with uh, with the time track uh, oh yes if you move yeah if you are smart moving the time track you are uh making a mess for your opponent <laughs> uh, you, you can even pass turns when the, when the, the opponent expects you to if you have uh, enough uh, spots on your uh, on your quilt already put and you are approaching the end of the game the opponent usually thinks well now he will buy this then he will go ahead uh, these many spaces so I have room for two moves be- before I uh, before we pass and I'll win and then you can just pass one turn if you have uh, counted your points and you uh, you will end up just ahead of them and uh, you will force them to lead and that's so smart I, I like this game <laughs> yeah there's it's part of like a whole series of Uwe Rosenberg's two-player games um which we talked about previously Caverna um yeah and Agricola and Le Havre uh, it's definitely the most competent and well realized of all of them. Yeah, yeah, it's also so smart and simple. I, I love it. I think it's it's well contained because you don't have too many things to look out for and too many components and things to organize on the table. But it already it still it still takes quite a hefty space on the table to be honest. And yet, yeah, so so many information contained in simple tiles and tokens and 
Yeah. Yeah, I think it's an easy recommendation. And I think most people agree that it's really good. Um, I, I look at the rank right now. It's currently listed at 108 overall, five for abstract, which is huge, um, and 13 for family because it is pretty accessible. Uh, it's just above War Chest on the abstracts. Um, which, oh, okay. Um, Azul's been knocked off the top spot by Cascadia. That's a side <sighs> thing. Anyway, um, I would I, say, I would say it's, uh, Batrock is a very good game for, like, um, players that at some point uh, have been playing, let's say, family or entry level games, uh, but uh, are like, okay, I'm now at the point where I want to get games where I think a bit more. Uh, and I think that's a very good uh, step up. Yes. Yes, I think that's true. So that was Patchwork and Patchwork Halloween. Same game, different coat of paint. Um, and now we're going to go way back in time. Not as far as the Bronze Age, but definitely a time before Shakespeare. It is era medieval age with Alessio. Take it away, Alessio. Yeah. So era medieval age. Uh, this is a 2019 game from Matt Leacock, the one from Pandemic, for instance, oh. Pandemic Legacy. Uh, yeah, and it's a roll and build game. Now, uh, this game is basically a successor of Roll Through the Ages, uh, so uh, its mechanics are really nothing new. There is a bit to know and some fun strokes which are which make this game really unique. So uh, we will talk about this. Uh, now, how does it play? Uh, this is basically a roll and build uh, game. The, the first important thing is the gimmick, which is you don't have a sheet of paper to write your buildings, but you are basically uh, you have a pegboard with a lot of buildings which fits pegs uh, it plays one to four players and uh, each player has their own pegboard with their own resource track and their own uh, medieval will village they are trying so, to so build. it's a roll and peg uh, yeah exactly roll and Ooh, build on I, pegs. I, be yeah. careful with that <laughs> Roll uh, yeah, exactly. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, English not being my first language, sometimes it, things yeah. slip it's up. So, it's so oh. right, I'm sure many people didn't catch that, but I did, and I'm not going to miss a chance to make a pegging joke. Carry on. Oh, yeah, these are pe pegs on pegboard, okay? Only, only, the pegs only go to the pegboard. In the pegboard, okay? <laughs> uh, yeah. Doctor's advice. Th this is a game, yeah, this no. is a game, not a toy. Oops, sorry. Yeah, <laughs> okay, and that aside, um, let's forget about pegs for a while. Uh, you start uh, with a few dice of different colors, each die represents something, for instance the yellow dice are for the farmers, you have grey dice for the soldiers, uh, white dice let's say for, for priests and academic, uh, blue dice uh, if I remember correctly for nobles or something like that. You start with a set of dice and you begin rolling them and gaining resources from them, uh, building stuff and going on. Uh, the beautiful part is that uh, you have this 14 by 14 pegboard where you have to put your buildings. Uh, there's a, a tactile satisfaction in having to actually physically slot the slot the the buildings in, and uh, uh, you are basically playing like this. Uh, the the game goes in a sequence of rounds, and each round has six phases. The first uh, phase is rolling; everyone rolls the dice, and this the here there's the first uh, interesting touch they give to, they gave to the game. Uh, basically. Uh, on each, uh, since you are in uh, medieval age, uh, there are disasters and famine and stuff all the time. So whenever on your uh, your your roll, uh, your dice rolled have uh, uh, faces, and in their faces there are a lot of symbols usually, uh, resources mostly, swords for uh, uh, military power, and skulls representing disasters. 
Now you can roll all your dice and you are forced to keep all dice showing skulls. You can re-roll the others. So uh, you roll uh, dice, you keep, you must keep some dice and you can, if you want, keep all the others and you can re-roll a set of dice, pushing your luck and trying to not get skulls on those dice. And uh, you can re-roll up to three times in this phase. Then you keep these rolls hidden and you show them in the subsequent phase. This is very cool because uh, the number of skulls you get, you get a disaster of increasing gravity. Uh, so uh, one skull is bad, six skulls is very, very worse. And uh, uh, all skulls you uh, annotate on your uh, disaster track get you uh, negative points at the end of the game. Uh, plus all the bad effect the skulls get. But if you get a certain specific number of skulls, like three and five specifically, the disasters happen not to you, but to all of your opponents. And that's enough to make this game a completely, uh, a, a completely competitive uh, and uh, you can basically do any kind of duck stabbing and weird moves here. Uh, this is the first one. Uh, the second part is that if, after you roll the, all your dice, you basically have to collect the resources uh, you have written there. Uh, you uh, basically move the pegs on the pegboard uh, with, uh, with the number of resources you get. Then you have to feed. Uh, you have to uh, remove grain, one, one grain resource, for each die you rolled. For each uh, dice die you cannot feed, you get another skull in the uh, negative points track. After that, uh, you build. So you use the resources to build uh, buildings. The buildings give you more dice or give you more points or give you special effects like rerolls and stuff like that, special rerolls, or culture, which is a special kind of currency which nets you direct uh, victory points and who collected the most, uh, the most uh, culture at the end of the game gets five extra points and uh, so on. Uh, and you get uh, building and building up your city. Uh, an important thing, an important part of this building is that you can build city walls. City walls are useful because they prevent uh, the spreading of a part of the disasters. For instance, uh, if uh, your buildings are, uh, are enclosed in walls, uh, they don't uh, uh, get propagation of diseases and uh, after uh, that aside the all the all the buildings inside completely enclosed in walls uh, they are worth double points at the end of the game so it's important to wall but the walls by themselves are not worth a lot of points so it's a balance between that so would uh, you recommend building a wall to keep them out uh yeah <laughs> definitely uh, uh mostly this game uh, uh, the, the, the smart of this game is uh, building walls uh, until you are sure that the game is about to end uh, the game ends when uh, I think there are five, but uh, depending on the number of players, uh, you start with less. There are five markers which are uh, which have uh, a blank side and a side with an X. They start all on the blank side, and whenever a type of building uh, uh, in the reserve uh, is not available anymore, you flip one mark. When all marks are flipped at the end of a, of a turn, the game ends there and you count points. There is one last thing that you do at the end of uh, one game turn, which is beautiful, and it's extorting stuff from other uh, players. Basically, uh, you can roll swords, which are your military power. He, uh, the player who rolled uh, more swords can extort from the player, from the players who rolled less swords than them 
each player can do that. So the player with least swords get extorted by everyone. They can extort one resource from each player uh, of their choice. So basically, uh, this is a beautiful game because you can uh, try to pursue multiple tracks to victory, which is very important in games when you roll, basically to win, because you have multiple paths to victory and every single one of them is uh, uh, remunerative, fun and uh, very playable in the end. So that's basically it. When the game ends, uh, you count points. Uh, wallet, wallet, uh, uh, wallet buildings count double. Uh, you get negative points for the skulls. You, uh, when uh, when there are disasters, you basically resolve disasters, which end uh, putting a badlands token, which is a three by three token, in the middle of the. In the middle of your uh, field so they can be bad there is a lot happening in this game everything is 3d and beautiful and why don't have more games like this <laughs> so uh, this is basically how the game flows uh, it has one expansion which has rivers and uh, wharfs and bridges and stuff like that it's actually very funny but i don't on this so i won't talk a lot a uh, lot about this i managed only to play a couple of times at the friend's house and i had a blast but uh, strategies change uh, quite a bit because you have different disasters uh, having uh, river tokens uh, there are floods for instance and stuff like that uh, this is basically it uh, kind of your usual roll and write game but with 3d components and a lot of things which increase interaction so that's why i feel i can recommend this i think it's a seven and a half in my scale and i rank this over railroad ink <gasps> yeah uh, base red or ink at least because uh, I don't I didn't play green and yellow but uh, red and blue absolutely yes although red or ink is in Italian production so <laughs> <laughs> go on horrible guild I have to say uh, I like this one better yeah I um I have a very old original release copy of Roll Through the Ages of Bronze Age from two thousand and eight. Uh, it's what got me to buy the whole Griffin book, uh, bookshelf series. Um, Roll Through the Ages definitely shows its age um, in that it's one of the first Roll of Rights, if not the very first one. Um, I will say there is one big thing that uh, Roll Through the Ages has done that era medieval age has failed to do, and that's I want a wooden version. I don't want plastic. I know the plastic <laughs> yeah. looks super cute and cool, yeah. but I am past needing that much plastic for a game, especially a game with such heavy pegging as this, um, where, uh, you know, wooden pegs and wooden tracks are just fantastic. They've been like that for years, um, and I would like to see a, a wooden version. I'm on board if they do, um, but it does look really pretty, and it has that nice thing that when we talked about Caverna before, has where at the end of the game you can stop and you can have a look at what everyone else has built. And be like, oh, that looks nice. Um, yeah. So, sorry, I'm uh, thinking about wood. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, Alessio, uh, this reminds me in some ways of My City. Obviously, My City is an ongoing legacy campaign style game. But yeah. do you feel there's like, it feels like there's some similarities there? Uh, does it appeal to maybe the same people? People who like My City may enjoy. Uh, this well uh, there are a lot of city building games uh, uh, my city is the one from knixia right uh, because there's also my little city you are talking about my city from Rainer knixia uh, yeah right? that's that's Legacy. my city yeah. yeah 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 okay uh yeah i i think that people who like my city will absolutely love uh, could absolutely love uh, 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 era medieval age with uh, one specific warning 
uh, there is a lot of player interaction and if your opponent is a total bastard they can keep rolling three skulls and fill up your board with useless badlands terrain and if you are there just for the for enjoying your buildings uh, you will not because you are you will be cursing uh, everything that your opponent will do so uh, with this specific warning there's a bit more competition uh, you will definitely like it because it's in the same kind of game yeah, yeah. and as an alternative if you want to be constructing lots of uh, cities out of plastic buildings but you want different mm -hmm. mechanics you can take a look at foundations of rome um, but that is an expensive purchase it's big yeah yeah uh, anyway my city also is a great game to play so you you, you can get really go wrong there yep there we are there's we've recommended a lot of additional games here it's like this one and this one we may revisit some of those in the future and talk about them in some detail uh but i think with that brick in the wall this is all we have time for in this episode <laughs> Uh, you can catch us over at www.patreon.com forward slash the last standee or on our various social medias or on board game geek and until next time we have been the last standee so goodbye from alessio hello bye audrey bye bye and myself a toodle pip and remember that the second e in standee is for era because why would it not be it was easy yes an easy goal <laughs>